Get 60% off Season 1 of We Chose Play until December 31st, 2023 at affectautism.com slash play using the promo code WCP60AFFECT. That's WCP for We Chose Play, 60, affect. That's less than 20 US dollars. Don't miss this incredible opportunity to watch six episodes of One Family's Floor Time Experience from birth through diagnosis to choosing DIR floor time to starting to use this approach. A strength-based, loving, empowering, accepting, and advocating approach at affectautism.com slash play through to the end of the year. You're listening to Affect Autism where affect is the number one tool we use in supporting child development through playful interactions. Welcome back, listeners. I am Daria Brown. This is Affect Autism. And this week I have Galena Iskovich, who is a clinical social worker in New York City. She is a DIR expert and training leader who teaches and supervises. And she is program director at the Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy Study Center, in their refugee support project called On The Move. She presented at ICDL's conference in the fall, an incredibly powerful presentation about the trauma and floor time techniques and working with refugees and working with people in Ukraine during war. And she talked about grounding techniques and downregulation techniques and how to help support parents with their children going through this trauma. And we thought um, this would be something to bring to the listeners where kids here are watching the news and going through all of these um, experiences and fears. Welcome back to the podcast, Galena. Great to be here, Daria. Thank you so much for all the work you are doing with refugees and with people in these traumatic situations. It's, It's just horrendous and it's heartbreaking work. I know there wasn't a dry eye at your presentation, especially when you're showing the drawings from children, which we'll talk about later. But um, today we are going to focus on affect cueing. She talked a lot at the conference. You talked a lot at the conference about affect cueing when we're grounding and how to be aware of ourselves so we can co-regulate and downregulate our play partner. And you mentioned that a lot of times it's the kids doing that for the parents too, which is a little bit tough when you think about the situations that people are in. By all means, because uh, look, uh, terrible things, terrible events, wars, disasters happen to everyone. It's what we do with that. That's what's important. And it's good when we have at least somebody by our side to help us go through it in one piece physically and emotionally, because the physical part of the war, thankfully, one day will come to an end. The emotional part will stay for years. We need to figure out how to deal with it in the moment, how to live through it, how to deal with the chronic stress of war and anxiety, constant anxiety on our plate, and how to make sense of it after it's over. So it's a lot. It's really a lot. Yeah, it really is a lot in Galina's presentation. She focused specifically on the war in Ukraine. But because this is so applicable to, like you said, everybody goes through traumatic experiences in their lives. And when you have that chronic anxiety, especially as a parent worrying for your life, for your child's lives or for, um, you know, psychological situations that are horrendous, how to be there for the kids when the parents as well need so much support. So where do you even begin when you get a family and you're working with a family online and, and they've, they're they going through something horrendous? How do you even begin that conversation? I begin with myself. I need to calm down. I cannot work with somebody when I'm stressed. I can't breathe. I can't breathe out. I can't attune to their stress because I'm deafened with my own stress. And stress is something that is in our bodies a lot. We feel it right away. You know, a curious thing happened to me uh, right before the Ukrainian war, just weeks before. I was on vacation in Quito and I was standing on the top 
balcony admiring the beautiful view and there was an earthquake and I found out what I've been learning from those who knew it and what I've been teaching I felt it in my gut the time changed the time was moving very slowly I was like in a slow mo I'm thinking of it must be and and it goes that slow it must be an earthquake the balcony is about to break off because rocks start falling the stones of the building and the bell tower starts chiming but i'm in my own movie where everything happens so slowly then somebody else came along i was able to snap out of it and i stepped back right in time not to be hit by, by a stone. So yes, time is very slow during trauma. Our decisions are off. So the first thing that you do, you untraumatize yourself. You use whatever tools you know to calm down and you feel you cross the midline. Uh, hemispheres talk to each other. For those listening on audio, Galena is hugging herself, putting her right arm on her left shoulder and her left arm on her right, well, just under the shoulder, giving herself a hug. And so you're crossing the midline, you're feeling that physical touch of the hug, and it's a calming technique. Yes, and it crosses the midline, which is very important. But another important thing is that you have, when you have a child next to you, it gives you an opportunity to do your own and hug the child. Make sure that the child needs a hug. Mm. And you let the child hug you. Very helpful. You breathe. You make sure to breathe with the full volume of your lungs. I call it unpretty breathing when you put the air into your stomach and it doesn't look good. A, a physiotherapist told me that a lot of times people hear about the breathing, you breathe in and you watch your stomach rise. But she had said, think more of it as your rib cage expanding, not just going to your stomach, but like taking it all in and your whole rib cage expanding. So it's a full, full breath. If you have time, you can do a little visualization. You can mentally follow the airflow to your rib cage. So you can notice how it expands and how you stomach expands you put your hands on your stomach and you see your hands move up when you breathe in you hold the breath then you breathe out and i will refer in the blog post to my podcast with dr stephen porges about the polyvagal theory where he talks about some of that stuff as well exactly exactly and speaking of polyvagal theory yes it really depends whether you learn about something on the news or you learn about something that will put you into immediate present danger and you need to run. So if it's on the news, you definitely need to calm down first. If you need to run, you need to get yourself into this, Dr. Porges says, ventral vagal state when you are not only calm, but you're ready for action. You can't fully relax. You need to be up and running, but not anxious because anxiety paralyzes us. It puts us into this state of immobilization. People in danger can't afford immobilization. They need to move. They need to run. Anxiety is good. Anxiety is something that made, made us who we are. We continue to exist because we were anxious. We were paying attention to sounds in the forest. We were paying attention to the intentions of our aggressive neighbor, right? Medieval <laughs> neighbor. We survived because of that. We need to be human. We need to be present. We need to help the other to survive. So we need to co-regulate with the scared child and help the scared child. You had mentioned using emotionally meaningful objects. Well, no technique can be applied in isolation. It needs to make sense. Mm -hmm. I don't like to do things that don't make sense to me. Right, right. I want to understand why. So if you want to do a little grounding, you need to use your environment. You need to see where you are, how safe it is. What can I do if you are in the crowded? And we had those situations with 
refuges when you're in a very crowded space. What can you do? The only thing that you have is yourself and the floor. Shift your weight and pay attention. By doing that, we're paying attention to our body. We're paying attention to own weight. So shift your weight from left to right. You can walk. You can pace. Dr. Porges would say, take a walk. <laughs> you need to move. That what will help you calm down. I would say use the environment. You can't walk. You can't do things that are not safe. But you can shift your weight from your left to your right to your left. You can release your neck muscles. You will need your neck. You will need your jaw. I just the other day I had a situation with a patient who was going through a tremendous stress with his daughter, and he developed a large jaw. As you shift from left to right and back to left and again to right, you can release your neck without moving your head as well. As you pay attention to parts of your body, you either tense or release it. Sometimes in order to release something, you need to tense up. If you have, if you try to tense up and you have nowhere to go, it means that you've been tensed already. It's very simple. Emotionally meaningful objects. You can always call them transitional objects. Things that remind you of your home. Things that will bring you back like your favorite pen, your favorite boy, your key to your house. This idea came from one of the refuges. I would like to hold on to the key and pay attention to the key and do the grounding exercise with my real key. It feels good. Now, I know that it's sort of become, I don't know if new age is the, the right term, but you see in stores soothing stones. And I know when I lived in Maine, be rocks from the ocean and you just touch the smooth stone to calm down. I guess that's a similar type of thing, except that a random rock from a store may not be meaningful. But if, if there are different things that help different people, you know, holding something in your hand. And like you said, if it's a meaningful object, like the key to the house that got destroyed in the war or whatever it is, and you're just holding it and just some kind of object to sort of focus your mind, I guess, away from anxiety. Although I, I can imagine some listeners might be saying, wouldn't that make me more anxious to be focusing on the key to the house that was destroyed? But it, I guess it really is individualized. But also, yeah, maybe it's not destroyed. Or maybe there is hope. Yes. Or maybe you can imagine a door that this key will open one day. Yes. So you use your imagination, but also it's, I think it's a good idea if it's grounded in your real life. And had I known that you mentioned the stones, I have a little stone of the beach where I have nothing better to do, but I drew a tiny fish there. I can do that much. A tiny fish, one eye and a tail. And a fin. And now it's meaningful. Now it's my stone. I can hold on to it if I feel like it. And as a parent, you could have these objects of that you're holding on yourself, but you could also encourage your children to have a meaningful object that helps soothe them. A lot of children have a favorite blanket or stuffed animal or things like that. So it's not that different from that concept. It's very similar. It's a transitional object that you and transitional object is something that is very good for the early separation from the attachment figure i don't want to get oh, no, overly scientific but let's make it very simple the parent is the primary attachment figure yes and when the child separates it's unexpected it's scary it's very difficult for a kid who does not still have the concept of object constancy. He separates from you going for the first time to daycare. He has no idea that he will ever come back. Say, I'll come back at night, but what does it mean? Dr. Gordon Neufeld talks about using those types of techniques with children for separation, like putting a little heart or stickers in the lunchbox. So when your children are at school, you have those different reminders to keep the attachment um, which is the opposite of what some people think because they think, oh no, if they're reminded of me, they're going to get upset and want to see me. But it actually has the opposite effect. And, and he talks about cutting out hearts and putting them on the pillow saying, 
I'll, I'll come and check on you every hour and put a heart here so that when the child wakes up in the morning, they have a pile of hearts next to their pillow and little things like that. And, and um, that's what you're referring to here. Make it more meaningful because now it's also your safety object. If you feel like you are worried too much about what's happening at home, hold on to the rock and feel the rock, let's say, or the key or the pendant that we made together. Hold on to that. Can you feel it? Is it smooth? Is it cold? Is it soft? Is it hard? Is it long? And while you're doing that, while you're thinking about the object, not about when will she come to pick me up. Yes. So you shift. If you shift your cognitive attention, you will shift your emotional attention. As you shift that, you go into a different state. You cannot be tense and relaxed at the same time. It's that simple. If your mind is relaxing, relaxing, your body will follow. If you relax your body, your mind will have to follow as well. It's really important to understand this connection and to see how it works. And I would say, don't work against common sense. Don't tell somebody who needs to run in a second that everything is fine. I've seen that with, with um, refugee kids where parents would say, oh, my child never experienced any problem. I don't know why he's showing all these symptoms now. He never knew what was happening. We closed all the windows. We turned off uh, all the devices. We shielded him. And we were running. And there were shots around. But we put the headphones on his head. And we put the dark glasses. And grandma was sitting over him, hovering over him physically so he wouldn't see what was going on around. My child is fine. And as we start working with the child, we start working with different um, mediums like kinetic stand or drawing or imaginative play. Horrible content starts coming out, pouring out. This was a child who was just dealing with multiple fears and his imagination drew pictures that were even worse than what was really going on. Yeah, sometimes when we try and shield too much, we deprive the children from having the chance of getting through it and building that resilience. COVID years, right? You had somebody in full isolation for three years and they come out and they catch every cold that's out there. The immune system weakened. So our emotional immune system needs to be okay. And also when you lie too much, it really affects the relationship. It's not a good idea to lie to kids. It's important to find meaningful, age-appropriate language. It's important to figure out how to express what you actually feel. I'm thinking of the movie Life is Beautiful, which, of course, is a very... You're shaking your head. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I had this experience with those parents who were saying, yeah, I shield my child from... Everything my child has no idea that have you watched the life is beautiful? <laughs> Forget <laughs> this movie. Forget this movie. You need to, whatever experience you go through, you need to be next to your child. It needs to be real. And as we find out at the end of the movie, the child, the child knew. The child was playing along in a way. The child was uh graceful enough to forgive the parent yes. but not so in real life and we don't want to present this additional challenge it's important to be together it's important to be co-regulated it's important to share let's say your child caught a glimpse of uh, what's happening on the screen it was unintentional well but it happened it's okay to say I'm scared too. Definitely. You know, not to not not to deny the feeling. Because we've been teaching them to name feelings. If they observe us being upset and we keep saying, oh, we're happy. It creates this tremendous confusion, this split. I know that you 
have created a book, if you're comfortable sharing that um, with drawings that children did. And some of our kids, for parents listening, may not be there yet. Uh, they may, our children may not be able to express themselves through drawing. Um, so we'll talk about other other things to do in play as well. But I I would love for you to share that that book as well. And can people find it? Yes, people can find that. They we have limited copies available for purchase, and this is a translation into Ukrainian. And uh, they did the illustrations together. The art therapist, our, our volunteer therapist, was sitting here in New Jersey in front of her screen and she was working on this core regulation and kids were producing okay let me find is Maybe. the title of the book a name a character's yeah. name yes yes this is the fly that is being captured by the evil evil spider and Yes, they can do it. They can sit together. They can follow the storyline. They can uh, produce. Oh, that's another spider with the Z, which is a it's a political cartoon basically, because the child thought of it. Yeah, this spider is the symbolic representation of what's happening right now to me because I'm no longer in my country. The spider is there, so we are moving into symbolic as we are doing this very simple task of illustrating a line in the book. Now, you mentioned setting expectations. And so I think this is where it comes up. How, how do you talk about that with parents, especially when our kids aren't necessarily um, understanding the, the realm of time yet? Yes, well, we are dealing adults high FEDCs, right? We are dealing with multiple realities and multiple uh, timelines. We can think of something, kids are dealing with, with the immediate timeline, also depending on, on where they're at. But we need to have this kind of perspective. What's going to happen next? What's going to happen tomorrow? What's my plan for the next week? When we lose control, that's a very, very difficult, painful, mind-boggling situation for us. We are capable adults. We've lived our lives. We managed our kids. Our parents managed their kids' disability. We managed so much, and suddenly we don't know what's going to happen next. That's a huge blow. So going back to the hugging exercise, I said at one point, that's the space that you can control. You can control one step. I can't even control that step for you, but I can stand right in front of you. Our heart. And I had a very touching feedback from one parent who lives in a war zone who said that I was out there and my kid was playing and suddenly we, we heard blasts and we ran to each other and we stood there just holding each other just feeling each other. And to me, I'm saying, no, 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 guys. Wrong use. You needed to run. These are multiple perspectives and multiple expectations. I need to comfort my, my child who needs a hug right now. But I need, also need to know, I'm the adult here, I need to know that we need to run. So setting those expectations, I can help you with setting expectations. My expectation of an adult would be different from my expectation of a child and their expectation of me. Sometimes some uh, magic feels good. Okay, we are talking to this mental health professional. She must know better. Well, then they're dealing with a huge disappointment because the mental health professional could not shield them from the experiences. I cannot shield anyone from anything. I don't have anything. Here, empty hands. But I can give you tools that may work, have the potential to work, work for other people. That's all I have. So setting expectations right is very important. It will help to diminish disappointment. Now, can we get into 
the topic where you presented a number of tips for parents around affect cueing and that co-regulation to help with the down-regulation if someone is really upregulated and very stressed. This is tricky because you made a very important point. We usually say that self-regulation stems from co-regulation when we talk about child development. First, you co-regulate with parents and then you eventually are able to self-regulate. And you presented it in an opposite way for the parents, which is the parent has to be able to self-regulate before they can co-regulate with their child. So that was an interesting spin on it to me because we're not talking about development anymore. We're talking about a parent who needs to be able to co-regulate and you can't do that if you yourself aren't regulated. Yeah, so simple things, your breathing, the feeling of your body, your own body in space, ability to relax, ability to, speaking of uh, polyvagal theory, use your vocal cords to relax your vagus nerve. Humming, putting your face, if you can, putting your face into a bowl with cold water, or sometimes ice cube works. Just hold on to the ice cube, use it for your hand, for your face, the ice cube will be gone and your anxiety will be gone. That's a good visualization uh, object as well. The square breathing, you breathe in on four, you hold four, you breathe out on four, you hold four, and you repeat it quite a few times. Squeeze and release. Dr. Porges says up to 300 times a day. Squeeze and release. Like I said, if you have nowhere to go, if you can tense, you know, then you have nothing to, to release. You need to squeeze, for example, and release. Squeeze and release. As you breathe, aware of yourself aware of where you are at. And for those listening on audio, Galena was squeezing her thumb with her fingers of her other hand and releasing, and then switching hands and squeezing her thumb and releasing. Be aware of your surroundings. This is very important because when we're anxious, we move into the headspace. I call it headspace. No windows. So you see, but you do not see. You need to be able to say to yourself, okay, <laughs> I'm looking at the license on the wall and I see that it's framed. The frame is dark green. While I was thinking about the dark green frame, I totally forgot about our podcast for this split second. But I can see where I'm going, which is important, which is a big part of our sympathetic activation. So for the sake of our child, we need to be active. We can't be just fully relaxed. We need to be active, but we also need to be calm. So trying to meet those two contradictory states, active but calm. And so once we are regulated, can you talk about the affect cueing to matching the child and helping them to co-regulate? Try to figure out your feeling. Try to name your feeling. Try to locate your feeling or stress in your body. Because some people are stressed and they have a knot in the stomach. Some people have constricted chest. They can't breathe. Other people feel blood bursting through their head. It's in my head. Some people feel very weak arms and legs. So there are so many ways to experience stress. It's important to have this body map. It's important to know where you feel the stress. Then you can ask your child where this feeling is right now. What does it feel like? Where is it? Let's concentrate on that place. Let's put it all together in the bundle and we'll leave it there. Now, what if your child doesn't know? 
or they're not able to? Well, you keep asking. You keep ask, asking. Repetition is what becomes the learning medium. If you're asking and they don't know, and then you might say, oh, my shoulders and neck feel so tense. My tummy has a knot or, or are you doing that? Then the child might just say the same thing because they're just scripting an answer without actually having that interception yet. But is that okay? In my tummy, let me, uh, what about your tummy? But if the child is in this sympathetic, stressful state, you will ask if it's okay to touch his tummy. Mm -hmm. And you can breathe together. As you speak to the child, as a professional, as a parent, as you speak to the child, notice child's breathing pattern. If you don't start breathing the way the child is breathing, you won't be able to relate. So really cueing in, not just to the affect, but to that breathing as well, and yes. everything that they're presenting, yes. By all means, affect starts with breathing. Okay. When we are stressed, we hyperventilate. So, yeah, we need to regulate, we need to co-regulate, we need to find the right rhythm, and we will do it together. Don't worry, I'm with you. Is it okay if I touch you? It might feel good. My hands are a little cold. I just had this ice cube. Would you like an ice cube? We don't know. Oh, it feels good on my face. What about yours? And you start doing this back and forth. So it all happens at the same time. You said, okay, let's talk about play. And I thought to myself, didn't we talk about play this entire time? It's all play. Play, well, we wish the play to be this isolated, great moment in our lives when we all feel good, but we play when we're sad too. We play when we're anxious. We probably will play something else. We will play differently. We will have less items available, but we will do something together, which is our play. So playing with our breath, playing with our objects, um, with playing with other. I playing with each other, playing with ideas, playing with, like you said, it just experiencing it together and seeing where the child takes it. What is the child offering us and trying to meet them where they're at? Yes, a very simple dialogue like, uh, why are we here? Why are we hiding? I don't know what's happening outside. What do you think is happening? Somebody evil. And kids sometimes ascribe meaning from video games, from different other experiences to what's happening. Kids find the meaning. And we may follow or we may say, no, wait a second. It doesn't mean that your video game is dangerous. Game is a game, but this is a real life experience. So we need to be quiet and we need to be careful. Many parents uh, relate to me that in the stressful circumstances, their kids on the spectrum became little adults. No more tantrums. No more disagreements. No more insistence on the routine. They would get up and run. Why? Because what autistic spectrum disorder does to the brain is very much similar to the sympathetic activation during the war. They've been at war already. This is the second war. They know what to do. They know how to run, how to hide, how to be quiet, how to take care of those who take care of them. Because adults were lost and confused and scared and crying. Somebody shared with me that she was, pardon me, in the bathroom. They needed to run, but she was in the bathroom. She couldn't leave the bathroom. And her kids were standing outside saying, Mom, we packed and we packed you too. Wow. Get ready and go. They know. They pay a price for knowing. Because this is the repeat exposure. 
but they know. So our job is to make it easy on them, to not let them go through it alone. Not to say, okay, I have my own adult things and you play with your toys, but to be with them, whatever the experience is. Well, thank you so much, Galena, for all of these tips. I'm going to put some information that you presented at the conference on these techniques in the blog post at affectautism.com. And I hope that you'll be able to join us one month at ICDL's Parent Support Group. It would be lovely to have you as a guest mm -hmm. if parents have questions about this kind of thing and, and when their kids are going through different kinds of traumatic experiences. So thank you so much. Um, I will put a link to get in contact with Galina if you are interested in the Ukrainian book with the drawings from children in it and anything, any last things you would like to leave us with. Well, it's important to be real. It's important to be available. It's important to play through whatever happens to us. And play is a very broad definition of our time together. And I enjoyed playing with you. Well, Thank fun. you so much. Me too. Thanks so much, Galina. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. And definitely I'll show up for the parent support group. Excellent. Get 60% off season one of We Chose Play until December 31st, 2023 at affectautism.com slash play using the promo code WCP60AFFECT. Until next time, here's to choosing play and experiencing joy every day.